Well, welcome everybody to Village 14's uh, sit down talk with the candidates. Uh, in the room, we have our three candidates for uh, Alderman at Large from Ward 5 Chris Steele, Deb Crosley, and Brian Yates. And uh, here in the room to ask questions, uh, a number of the Village 14 posters. We have Julie, Julia Malaki, Groot Gregory, uh, myself, Jerry Riley, uh, Greg Reedman, and I'm blanking. Gail Spector. Gail Spector. And we have uh, uh, possibly a few other uh, bloggers will uh, uh, come during the course of this event. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Julia Malaki. Okay, um, you all have a lot to recommend you, and some people, including myself, wish they could vote for all three of you. What can you offer that the other two candidates can't? And are there any issues you can cite where you disagree with the other candidates? Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to answer well, that I'm question. Go ahead. I think that, you know, one of the one of the differentiators that I bring is is that uh, I've got something of a financial background that is a little unusual to um, to the board. I, I spent over 11 years working at Ernst & Young. Um, in many cases, helping companies make decisions with regards to where they were going to go, but there was a very strong financial component to it, a uh, scenario planning component to it, wherein we took a very strong look as, at uh, what was going to make the most impact positively for that company, and then later on with some of the economic development work I've done for a community with regards to a certain course of action. So in terms of trying to figure out how a certain investment or a certain decision or a certain policy move would have implications going on down the line, as well as being able to try and factor in the, the well, the possible outcomes, the possible what ifs that come into that. It's a way of making sure that you've got a very thorough examination of all of the factors that go into making a policy decision, including all of the financial. That financial background I don't think is as common on the board as maybe we should want. Okay, I, I bring a unique uh, professional background as well. I think most folks know by now I'm an architect and practicing. Um, but combined with that I have a, a long resume of community service and I've worked on a wide variety of issues. It's, it's terrific to have a mix of, of professional backgrounds on the board, but I think as well, um, you know, there's many facets to putting a city together and to keeping it running and operational. Um, we all have to know how to read a budget. Budgets tell stories. It's not, um, we actually have a lot of bean counters in the administration and even on the board. And it's important to keep track of where the beans are going. Um, but more important than that is is that you're making wise decisions with those finances and you understand the meat of it. You understand um, how to make decisions relative to quality, quality of life, the quality of a structure, um, and something that's going to be dependable and that's going to be operationally efficient. So um, I bring, the, my, my community resume is um, 24 years prior to my sitting on the board and it's deep. i would started with the League of Women Voters, I've worked on issues um, and moved uh, uh, things forward ranging from elections, re election reforms in the year 2000 when I served as president of the League to uh, serving on human service um, resource boards such as the Pomeroy Foundation to uh, my techie nerdy side which is sitting on the Energy Commission for a lot of years, something called the High Performance Building Coalition and working on city planning issues. But it's an interrelated mix um, and, and the interrelationship and the coordination, <clears throat> the understanding of how things fit together is what really fascinates me. Um, and what really drives me is um, understanding that this is the people's place and you're doing all of this in order to take good care of it um, so that it serves everyone now and into the future. Well, I think uh, I was actually on um, one of those things that Deb cited. Uh, oh, the, uh, the, um, the Palmer House Foundation a different time than she. Uh, but in terms of what would I bring unique, uh, well, deep roots in the city. I. Uh, was not born here, despite what you may have read in Newton Graphic. However, I'm sixth generation. Uh, I have a great grandfather, the second power, buried down in uh, the the South Burial Ground down the street here. I came uh, to the city about 
50 years ago at about age five or somewhere the math may not work on that but nevertheless uh, that I went to uh, the Newton Public Schools graduated from Emerson now closed graduated from Meadowbrook now called Charles E. Brown and Newton South High much bigger than when I was there uh, and uh, that does give me the consumer's perspective I also worked in uh, neighborhood groups um, uh, well, around here, I was chair of the Upper Falls Advisory Committee, uh, which uh, led the revitalization of Petty Square. I was president of the Upper Falls Community Development Corporation. Uh, in that period of my life, I was uh, one of the members of the Newton Neighborhood Network, which I think is went defunct but uh, should be re revised now that we've got uh, neighborhood area councils everywhere. Uh, from I was also on the Zoning Review Committee uh, before I came on the board, uh, it was a mixed group of aldermen and uh, citizens. And uh, uh, when I, I joined the board, I'm now dean of the board. Um, uh, I've served on the zoning and planning committee since its inception. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot, seen a lot, and it gives me the ability to remember how the last time an issue was uh, was handled, like the one I've been using in the campaign, uh, uh, that I f fought unsuccessfully to preserve branch libraries. But I did learn after the, f the, uh, the early rounds were done, when we tried to have independent libraries, that you need the book collection. You just can't uh, keep the building or the room. So uh, when Wobbin and Arbindale were proposed for closing, I uh, made sure uh, that uh, the book collections would remain in place, and that gave the opportunity to the people of Wobbin and Arbindale to uh, actually um, uh, create really fabulous uh, n uh, community centers there that don't just uh, distribute books but have a wide variety of programs. Uh, that uh, I was going by the uh, the Wabin Library on a Sunday afternoon, and I was amazed to hear choral singing coming from there. So I think those buildings are extremely well used. I think there are other possibilities. I was also involved in uh, uh, the establishment of the Newton Community uh, of the Emerson Community Center and in saving Brigham House in the Highlands. Uh, the other thing that my uh, experience on the board is institutional memory, such that I know uh, what when laws were passed and what their intention was. So when I found, to my dismay, that uh, the building commissioner was, or the inspections commissioner, was giving building permits for older, smaller lots next to in substandard lots, I testified. Uh, against those permits before the ZBA, and Alderman Baker and I filed friend of the court brief at uh, the Mass Appeals Court, uh, and uh, the appeals court ultimately ruled, in fact, uh, those permits were illegal. That leaves us with uh, several very uncomfortable situations in the city, uh, and I intend to keep working to uh, get the administration to uh, instruct uh, the commissioner, if he's unclear on the intent of any zoning ordinances, and it's not something from Neolithic times, uh, you should ask uh, board members that are either still in the city, uh, still on the board, or still in the city. And um, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm proud that I was able to stand up for the, those people who wound up having to spend a fortune in legal fees. I, I have a question related to that. I'm actually okay. going to ask you to Alton Crosby. Okay. So, <laughs> what year term would this be for you? This uh, your third I'll, term? It would be my third so term. You've been on the board for four years. Now, Alderman Gates makes talked a lot about his being the dean of the board and his, and his vast experience, and we appreciate your service there. But I'm wondering from your perspective, how important is that kind of institutional memory as part of the board? How important is it to having people who have that in well, the mix? And, and are we in danger of losing that if Alderman Gates is not on the board? I think experience counts. Mm -hmm. um, and your record counts. So I think you have to look at both. I mean, you know, everyone has, everyone who served for a period of time in the community brings that experience with them. You always, as a friend of mine says, you everywhere you go, you bring yourself with you. And so, you know, your community experience, I think, counts as well. Um, and what have you been able to achieve, you know, since you've been serving on the board? So I, I think, you know, what your record is speaks volumes. Um, my record 
is, um, I think, very strong for four years on the board. I've been able to co work collaboratively with my colleagues and with the administration uh, to bring a number of initiatives forward to really make some progress on um, uh, our institutionalizing energy conservation by bringing the Green Communities Program to Newton and associated grants and associated recognition, which has brought, you know, enabled Newton to be involved in other programs as well and to expand its vision as to how it's going to um, conserve energy and uh, bring what I'll, I'll use the buzzword once, sustainability, uh, better sustainability to city operations. Um, it's a much bigger concept, though. I've been able to, you know, I said I was going to come in and work on infrastructure uh, maintenance, the take better care of our city and so forth. And by, again, uh, close collaboration, in this case with Alderman Fuller first, and then working with the department and the administration and then the full board of aldermen, uh, putting together a strategic plan to upgrade our sewer and water systems. Um, which yeah, I, I want to go back to the, to the yeah. experience thing. I asked you this. So, so there, <coughs> there's an opportunity here for, there's a chance here that Alderman Yates will not be on the board because mm -hmm. you might be, and should the people of Newton be concerned that we're losing that experience, or what's the trade-off? Well, first of all, it, it, I would, in any sort of a circumstance, anybody that would not make the seat is not certainly going to be leaving the city of Newton, so we would still have access to the knowledge. But we were just talking a little bit before. First of all, Brian, thank you very much for taking care of the library. The, uh, the voices that you heard singing were the Newton family singers, and my Excellent. wife thanks you for that. Well, um, it was beautiful. Your show is coming up about two weeks after the election, so just for a plug from a cultural side okay. of the Village 14 years that are around. Do you have tickets? Um, I think I do actually have tickets. Um, <laughs> I could sell some later. Um, with regards to, you know, really what we're talking about here is the breadth of experience that we want to have on the board as we go forward and the kinds of things that would come along. The paraphrase for Deb's comment before was something out of Bakura Banzai, which is no matter where you go, there you are. Um, we've all <laughs> gone through life experiences, both professionally and in the community, that we're going to bring to uh, to whatever, you know, whatever we do next. Uh, ideally, that uh, certainly I'm asking for the vote on November 5th. And uh, I think from what I could bring is a, a breadth of experience with regards to around the country and even internationally, things that have worked with regards to trying to get communities to solve certain goals, whether it's from uh, trying to bring inward investment or trying to revitalize downtowns, trying to address uh, issues of a legacy that is no longer there, however, trying to preserve the community's goals for what they'd like to become. Um, I've been doing that for 22 years, and uh, just being able to bring that sampling of things that have worked in other places that maybe we could work for Newton or maybe not work for Newton. I've been here in the city for 10 years, and I've been you know, picking up shovels and trying to get communities uh, you know, active in, in trying to preserve the neighborhood downtowns and keep them vibrant and active. Uh, I know people across the city and kind of where their minds are. I've been walking around the city talking to individual residents. I'm very excited about trying to bring my experience and my broad base of knowledge back to the things that we'd want to try and do here in the city. Okay, so let me bring that back to you, Alderman. Yeah, so I've, I'm not, to no fault of your own, this is the only at-large contest that voters in Newton get. Yes. And, and to no fault of your own, there's not that many opportunities this year to bring new blood onto the board. Mm -hmm. Why should voters not choose, in this case, to bring new blood onto the board, but instead to support you, you Old blood. Well. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, w I, w I, I have uh, transfusions uh, weekly. So. <laughs> but actually, I would like to think that, uh, frankly, a lot of uh, I've been pushing a lot of ideas for a long time and felt a lot of institutional uh, uh, reluctance to take them up, that uh, I think uh, the time has come for some of these things to actually be brought into effect. Uh, uh, Deb's work on uh, the uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, the completion of putting out the, the new water sewer meters means that finally we have the opportunity to uh, pick up an initiative that I made uh, several years ago to uh, put, give water sewer discounts on fees, they're not taxes, they're fees, to uh, of homeowners who are eligible for any of the inc low income based programs like fuel assistance, uh, food stamps, uh, and SSI, uh, which is 
really easy to do because uh, you just come in and show the proof that you're on the other programs and uh, that would uh, mean you'd be eligible for these discounts. Uh, similarly, I think that we, I've been working on zoning reform for a very long time and I think we now have the critical mass and I'll give good credit to Deb as the chairman of the Zoning Reform Committee that uh, there's a lot of things that have, uh, I've seen that uh, need to be done that were beyond, I think, uh, the institutional capacity previously. Like one of the, the key defects in our zoning is that we've grandfathered everybody and his brother. We've had uh, major zoning changes back in 1940, 1953, and uh, in trying to be nice back then, and I wasn't on either of those times, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, I believe the board uh, uh, was trying to be kind to existing homeowners, and in the broad parameters that they laid out, uh, they had zones that I think were aspirational, that, uh, well, when we have any more development of this size and this general scale, uh, that this is what it should be. However, there are big chunks of the city that uh, were not covered by that, that uh, were older, smaller, and as a result, uh, a ton of residential uh, homes are uh, non-conforming, uh, and I think we need to split the residential districts and remap substantial parts of the city to make as many properties as possible that are already occupied uh, conforming. Uh, and. Uh, I think that would give us enough leeway to uh, eliminate the straight-out grandfathering by date of construction or date of occupancy, which uh, has just, uh, as I know Deb can confirm, left us so that our, our zoning reform consultant, in trying to just simplify it, uh, sort of hit a, a dead end. And there were so many contradictions in the text as it exists that uh, we're going to have to resolve those before we can even simplify it. So, uh, no dead end, just a task. A task. Another, uh, well, that, uh, but a little disappointment that we, we thought it would, at least it could be made simple without uh, policy uh, discussions. And then getting into uh, the zoning reform generally uh, down the line that. Uh, what was the question, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is uh, Jerry Riley. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on on that issue uh, and sort of try to broaden it out a little bit. Um, you know, you all sort of have experience and 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 you know development and housing issues and zoning and all that. I think a big issue in general in the city, and there's no one answer to, is is you've always got these con conflicting uh, 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 interests between. Uh, expanding the tax base, development, um, and homeowners and uh, wanting to maintain their neighborhoods and their houses. So I guess it's a very general question. I'm sure it impacts zoning and development, all kinds of things. Can you all, can you, you know, all have some uh, discuss of this? Um, how do you, how do you, how do you put those two together? What are the trade-offs? Are there differences between you on how you see those trade-offs? And I guess just it, take it, away from there. It, there's a symbiosis there. It's not if you don't look at it as a conflict, as a negative. You look at it as a positive. You look at it as a problem to solve. Um, Look, you know, our city has changed over time and it's going to continue to change. There's always going to be development pressure. There's always going to be market pressure. We are a desirable place to live. Um, Newton is one of the best places to live. We have a fabulous school system. You know, people, there's room here for people to breathe and, and play outdoors and so forth, and yet we have, uh, you know, we're at the end of, uh, but, you know, easily accessible to public transit and so forth. We have a lot of things going for us. So that's, that draws interest in our community. Um, in fact, however, our population hasn't increased much over the decades. It's the demographic that changes. Um, even, even as, you know, uh, maybe since the 1960s, our population hasn't changed much. It's, you know, maybe from 80,000 to 85,000, something like that. It used to be 95 before that. And actually, yes, it had decreased a little bit, too. So um, it's not the sheer number of people, but how do we organize ourselves? And, you know, where do we want to concentrate new development? And are our rules, going back to zoning reform, are they facilitating the kind of development we want? And I would say right now, no. I mean, we've expressed what we want in the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2007, uh, adopted by the Board of Aldermen, 
and used, I think, actually by this current administration as one of the platforms that they that uh, Seti Warren built his campaign upon. Uh, that and the Citizens Advisory Group report and um, the Energy Action Plan and all the plans that came really from, you know, what a terrific and deep and intelligent community is here and how many people contributed to those consensus documents. Now we have an opportunity to implement some of these things. Um, so I don't see, yes, in any one individual project there's always going to be tension. There's always going to be tension at the edges of things. And so how we define those edges, where's the edge of the business district in any particular um, village? It's going to be different, very different for, say, Wobbin than it is for Newton Center or West Newton. Um, it's going to be very different for uh, Needham Street where we are now and you know what should that boundary be and then should there be a secondary boundary which is one of the the ideas that we put forward in the comprehensive plan and also in the zoning reform um, uh, blueprint if you will because that's what our group was charged to do is write a blueprint for how the reforms might uh, be addressed um, so I, I think it's really a fascinating puzzle to solve I think that over time we're developing a little more political discipline and will to go there, um, and I think, um, you know, I think we can't go fast enough. Uh, Greg just, uh, with the Newton Needham Chamber of Commerce, just hosted the other night um, um, a forward-looking event to try to get Newton and Needham really talking to one another about this area here, this Needham Street corridor, and, you know, how do you address that so that you're putting all the goods and services that make sense into this community, but we have a responsibility in Newton to look further than that. How do you connect this potentially extremely vibrant uh, corridor with the villages that abut it? Okay. And actually, I just wanted to, Jerry, one of your questions was really, you know, a little bit more of a tax base on top of this development kind of a concept. And it's something that's interesting. It came up as a conversation during the overrides back this past spring with regards to why is why as Newton are we going down this road on overrides when we haven't in the past. Newton as a city is a pretty unusual animal. It's, it's a residential city. Um, most of the cities in Massachusetts have much more of an industrial commercial base which tends to provide a lot more of the tax base and a lot of the towns which are much more of a residential base, they can really kind of focus on, on specific things that they need in terms of schools and it's a lot more definable. So when you go for an override discussion, it becomes a lot easier to try and kind of wrap your hands around it. Here in Newton, we are, I say again, residential city. Uh, and it's become more so over time if you look at what the tax base is. We are, we are overwhelmingly, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but uh, we've had the, the proportion of the, uh, the tax base that's residential has grown over time. We have all these other kind of opportunities here for, um, for really kind of being part of the regional economy a little bit more. Uh, the N2 event the other night I think was a great first step on it, but we've got to start asking ourselves some questions with regards to what, what level of participation do we want to have. Um, we're sitting here just at the doorstep of 128, which carries in terms of opportunities. This is what's referred to in the state's legislature as the Innovation Corridor. And we have a real opportunity here with regards to companies want to be here. People want to be here from the residential side. That's the residential side of the pressure. But what about this other side where maybe we have some opportunities for bringing some things in that can offload some of that tax burden onto the commercial side of things? But we've got to do so in a very, very thoughtful way so that we don't actually create a problem in terms of traffic, in terms of changing some of the character of the abutting areas. It's a fascinating question. It's, it's something, you know, I've been seeing a lot of the, uh, the pressure and kind of the demand side of it from the, uh, from the corporate side for some time, as well as some of the things that Mass Econ and MOBD have been pushing that I've been part of those discussions. I'd love to be part of that conversation. Uh, well, I think the issue that you bring up is the, the balance between uh, uh, the property rights of individual owners and the property rights of uh, those people that abut them. I went to the Historic Commission last night and I uh, basically uh, found them agonizing over th this very issue that uh, some people would come in and say, I really want to build, uh, tear down this house, put up this nice new one. And uh, other people in that neighborhood would say, no, you're, you're like the third t uh, tear down on that uh, street and it was so pretty before and now everything that's coming in is way too big. And uh, the commissioners uh, had to strike a balance on that. We uh, on the board have to strike a balance, particularly on the special permit. Uh, actually, case by case, as well as in 
uh, the overall that I I don't think we, it's really a tax base driven uh, a thing that I, I at least on the individual parcels that uh, it, it's what's reasonable that I think what ultimately was done uh, on uh, you know, Riverside for example uh, you had uh, the issues of uh, a lot more traffic and it seemed like the only way to do it was to uh, uh, get a, uh, the traffic not to come in via Grove Street, which seemed like a real hard thing to do, but eventually <coughs> they did manage to do it. Uh, and there was the combination of uh, other factors there that went, uh, when can you bring in uh, retail and uh, how much of a market uh, in place do you need there? Uh, I would cite, I, I went to N2 uh, uh, the other <coughs> night, too, or is it N squared, Greg? N squared. N squared, okay. Uh, and the thing that struck me about uh, the, the group's reporting uh, uh, was uh, a number of people, I think they were uh, saying, well, gee, uh, we need a lot of amenities here to make it nice, like uh, Kendall Square, and, and we need restaurants particularly. And I was thinking, well, do you know that Mobile Book Fair and Newbury Comics is down the street uh, across the river in Needham? Uh, is, is that something that you, you might want to go to? Uh, if you're talking about restaurants, Dungarren's, uh, the Biltmore, cited by uh, Boston Magazine, are all up in Upper Falls, are the people who uh, work uh, over in N2, are, are they aware of that? Can there be interchange back and forth? Uh, are, are any of the people from N2 going to enjoy uh, the car, uh, the uh, uh, the Upper Falls Greenway uh, that Jerry and Jim work so hard on? Uh, I, I think a good start on N2 would be a, a directory of everything that's there, like you go to a, a, a a shopping center and they give you a map of where everything is in the building by category so that you can figure out uh, what's available there. And I think that would be excellent. I, I think you also need to have the Department of Recreation and Conservation involved as well as uh, probably uh, Newton Conservation Commission because you do have the Charles River Pathway uh, that uh, goes through the, the corridor that uh, I mean, your symbol is uh, uh, Hemlock Gorge and Echo Bridge, and I think if people were aware, I mean, the little pathway down on the Needham side, uh, starting at uh, Highland Avenue, and uh, going down uh, into uh, the Needham Crossing area, uh, are people really aware of that? And uh, if not, uh, let them know. So I, I think to go back, yeah, it's a balancing act between uh, a a property rights of somebody who wants to do more with their property and somebody who wants to enjoy their property uh, the way it is and feels threatened by um, uh, new developments. That, and uh, it, directly or indirectly, we set many of the parameters and guidelines for that, and it is uh, a fascinating uh, case to make, both setting out the general parameters and implementing them case by case, which we do through special permits. Just real quick, with regards to the promotion of the things that we do have, and this comes back to the N squared conversation, which is probably something we should re revisit later. The Economic Development Commission, it, if you were at our awards on Monday night, you saw some I was. types of a map that, that we have put together that actually lays out all of the restaurants across the city. Mm. It's the first step of really trying to get some promotion out there for a lot of the a lot of the things that happen to village centers, starting with the restaurants. And we're going to be placing those. We're going to try and place those. We're going to get sponsors. We're going to be trying to uh, place those both at uh, some of the local hotels, at Excellent. City Hall, as well as at some of the uh, the college. Um, the, um, the student centers across the, uh, the city as well. That's terrific. One thing I've wanted to do for a long time is have a comprehensive booklet uh, that, like other cities do, mm -hmm. like Cambridge and well, Boston, but Cambridge is the one that strikes me, and even uh, Waltham, uh, brochures about what the local attractions are and what visitors would want to go to and have those in the lobbies of the hotels. Like the Indigo didn't even have a, a brochure rack, which I found bizarre. Uh, but uh, I think uh, letting the visitors know uh, is a very important thing. And we recently found out, uh, I guess from the Housing Partnership, that the provision of the zoning ordinance that uh, kept hotels under the inclusionary zoning uh, was seriously discouraging any new people, any new hotels from coming in. So, and it yielded 
no benefit. We've known that for a long time. We and raised that in zoning that's reform. We pushed yeah. from our well, on EDC. Yeah. We, we saw well, that coming in from requests to us. Well, that, that's Question. great because uh, uh, when uh, we're, we're documenting that, we've scheduled that for consideration on November 13th, and if we can get that done by the end of the year, then maybe uh, uh, we could get another hotel because as I, I look down here at um, Avalon <coughs> Bay, I mean, that, that's a decent use, but... Uh, that wouldn't be a, wouldn't have been a bad site for a hotel either. Uh, well, I'd like to m talk about. The, I, I think promotion is great. You know, understanding what we have. Of course, you ha always have to have an inventory of what you have, and and uh, promoting it through the chamber's work and and ourselves through the EDC. I think is uh, very important. But I want to go back to strategic planning, if we may. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in um, putting your arms around the entirety of a problem and looking at, you know, okay, so you have the inventory, you know where you are, and having a pretty clear vision of where you want to get to. I mean, that's what we did in the water sewer plan, but to get sort of up out of the gutter and onto the streets, you know, I, I think we have a lot of work to do in the city. It's not only zoning reform that's going to help this. We need actionable master plans. Um, and it may seem like we've been spinning our wheels for a number of decades in certain areas of the city, for example, Needham Street. Um, and we have been, but we have not engaged, uh, for example, what Needham did about 20 years ago, maybe, maybe a little less, uh, is they hired Goody Clancy. Um, so we've never in Newton hired a professional entity to help guide us, someone who's sort of politically removed from, you know, or, or is removed from politics, but who could guide us professionally and let the politics happen. But, um, for example, take the Needham Street corridor. Again, it's not just about the street. It's not just about the streets and the businesses that abut the streets, but it's about how we transport people through this area of the city um, from village to village across Needham Street. A lot of people have talked for a long time, and I think, Brian, you have too, about uh, creating ways behind the businesses for people to travel from business to business so that you're taking some of the traffic off the corridor. The Greenway is a, a first tiny, lovely step toward that. Um, but, you know, we really were talking about roadways and so forth. So how do you get from here to where we want to be? In part, it, you have to be brave enough to put, you know, make some limited investments, but, you know, to, to start mapping some of this stuff. This is what we want. Why haven't we ever engaged some professional uh, it's, it's, you know, there's never enough resources, and you know the administration has to buy into this. So the uh, this time, this administration has bought into buying professional resources for zoning uh, reform. It's limited. Um, it's gone slower than some of us would like. Not just because we've confronted conflicts in the code, but uh, there's a resource issue right. as well. There's a staffing issue mm -hmm. as well. And you know, there's an, this is a big. It's a big city for the size of our, uh, for how many resources we have to apply to it, and the range of things that uh, citizens of Newton have come to expect in terms of services, um, and and you know where we want to go. So yes, we have a pretty robust planning department, but the workload is huge. Uh, two things on that that. Uh uh, I thought I kept pretty good track of uh, what goes on in Needham, which is my birthplace, and um, I, I was not uh, familiar with the study that uh, Deb was citing, and frankly, I'm not that impressed with what's happened like in downtown Needham. I think it's kind of sad that a town of that affluence and that level of education has lost the only bookstore that they had. Uh, so. Uh, well, the study was not actually in the Needham Center. The study oh. was in the business district that abuts uh, the Heights? Newton. Yeah. Uh, oh. So that's, that's where this, oh. their, their economic oh, so, development... Oh, yeah, so they changed their zoning down across the river Correct. here somewhere. Correct. Okay. It was how to bring a more solid commercial base to the city of Needham and where those boundaries should be. Um, of course, they only have one town center, so it's a little easier problem to solve than it's going to be in Newton. Um, but that's what that study was. In fact, I first learned about it in the first meeting of the so-called Frameworks Committee, that, that which preceded the oh, yes. Comprehensive <laughs> Planning Group, 
that room full of 24 people, the day I met mm -hmm. Phil Hare, he laid out all these documents and gave mm -hmm. us all homework, Professor we, Hare. We could probably move away from Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But this is your round table Oh, no. I, th I think we, <laughs> no, I think we need to uh, go really through each page of the zoning discussion. code, <laughs> and we can uh, discuss every paragraph in, in great detail from all of our perspectives. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, this group, Gregory, I've got, a, I've got a question. I think there have been some really interesting ideas. And you know, as a blog, our role is to try to get information out into the community. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen some recent examples of people, citizens, being surprised mm -hmm. by things going on in town that are affecting mm -hmm. them. How, how have you and how will you uh, communicate to your constituents, and this is citywide, even though there's a word fly focus here, mm -hmm. that to let people know that there's something that should be of interest to them so they can participate and no longer be surprised. So, Greg, let me kind of take that on just a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Call me in back. late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Groot, I, both professionally and also with things that I've done within the, uh, within the city, uh, you can't move forward unless you've actually got a consensus behind what you're trying to do. In some cases, that yeah, I'm not saying that you've got to get everybody to agree right off the bat. In most cases, you've actually got to do you've got to spend some time actually educating people with regards to what you're trying to achieve, as well as get the feedback from them with regards to where their concerns are and what other things they've got on their mind. You might be able to solve at the same time. Uh, definitely, we do that with regards to the economic development work, the community development work that, that I and my firm does. But here around the city, both with the, uh, the things that I've done with the Economic Development Commission, as well as the work that we did with the Wabin Area Council in terms of trying to get that together, um, it's, it's really absolutely critical to go out there and get people together. Uh, I know pretty much exactly the projects that you're talking about, and you know, in terms of some of the things that we've got to achieve with regards to affordable housing, some of the things that we've been talking about here with regards to economic development, all of that is going to require you know, a couple of different steps. First of all, going out and saying, listen, this is the concept of, this is the problem that we think that we need to solve. From the community, what are your perspectives on this with regards to your concerns? Let us get you the answers with regards to your concerns. But then let's also engage you in actually getting the, the, uh, the problem solved. Some cases we don't actually have the luxury of being able to do that over an extended period of time. We have an opportunity, we have a proposal that comes to us. It still is incumbent upon the city, though, to be able to educate the community on exactly what's going forward and to do so very proactively so it doesn't kind of come up very, very late last minute. Um, you know, I know that we're talking about this in abstract, but you know, at least in, in some cases we're talking about Engine 6 here with regards to the affordable housing proposal that was put forth. Um, you know, I think that we kind of missed the boat on that in two different places. One was, at least two different places, one was up front with regards to making sure that word got out to the community that this discussion was going on and educating them as to exactly what the proposal was so that people could get comfortable or get their questions out there with regards to what is the track record of this developer, what are the track records of the, of the, of the organizations that are involved in here so that you can actually understand what's being proposed so that you can understand the successes that have been done by this particular organization over time, so that you can actually get a chance to talk to some of the individuals that have come through these kinds of these projects in the past, as well as registering, well, what's different about this particular project in this neighborhood that, that those organizations are going to have to take into account? Yeah, that actually, let me, if I could. Yeah, sure. I think the, uh, the question is really, how do we get the word out? Because I ran a construction on Center Street coming down here. Oh, God. And it would have been nice to know that it was going on. Uh, it was a, only a minor thing, but. How do we communicate? There's no perfect vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, I, heard the, I heard your question. It's something that I think this community has been struggling with for decades. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have two newspapers in this community. We used to have the graphic and the tab. It was actually terrific to and have And the villager. Two. Yeah, it was. It's terrific to have competition among a real news source that people actually are are reading widely. Um, that's no longer the case, um, and I'm I'm sorry to say that. I know we have roots here in the town, <laughs> and I read my tab. Um, but you know, the news in the tab has has been you know dwarfed uh, over the years by just you know shrinking resources and um, it's we have the one paper. And it's a weekly, 
So when I mean, you talk about needing to get information out quickly to people, there's really not one, there's not one vehicle. Blogs are great. Everybody doesn't go to blogs. Um, you know, email is great. Everyone doesn't use email or doesn't use it regularly. I know the administration has been building an email list. Um, you know, if it's an extreme emergency, I know the administration has uh, continued to fund uh, the alert system where people get called. There's just not one perfect system, however, and the truth is a lot of people who live in Newton are not focused on Newton. They're focused on, you know, they, they're, they go in town, they work in town, they maybe work overseas. Um, they're busy, and families are busy, and they're not necessarily paying attention to local politics. There's a few hundred or maybe a thousand people who are really taking, you know, or are involved, I think, in, in what's going on locally and maybe some more who are, are paying attention, you know, but, um, it, and I think that's reflected clearly in who comes out to vote. And we had an 11 percent turnout in the preliminary election. I'm hoping, you know, we're going to get 25 percent turnout in this race, but that's, that's, that's a hope against hope, I think, you know. It's very important that people come out, uh, pay attention to who's representing them because it, it matters, you know, we're the decision-making body and it, it matters. Uh, when it comes down to making those decisions, how people are voting. Um, so I don't know what the answer is to your question. I think, you know, there's, there's a, just like there's multi-modes of transportation and people will choose one or another, there's, there's multi-modes of communication and people will choose one or another or they will not choose any of them. So, you know, when an extreme issue comes up or one that people might think is extreme, whether it's a new a development of any kind or whether it's a development uh, that involves affordable housing. In my experience of working on affordable housing both as a professional, as an activist, and as an alderman, there are always people who come to the table late and say, but I didn't hear about this until last night. Um, it, with. It, on the Engine 6 matter, I personally contacted the formative Wabin Area Council and the Improvement Society and got the word out through their lists, which were forming, were hundreds but not thousands, and so forth, you know, so, and there's a public process, and the public process was followed to a T. Um, but a lot of people, again, don't read the notices. But not to tab, a conclusion. You know, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we failed on that project. We, the administration, um, we, we failed in our obligation to, to, ser to fulfill a public process that, that um, is promised with respect to those kinds of projects. Um, I really can't say any, anything more clearly than that. It, or were there things we, anybody, there's always things you can do better. Um, and that's true whether you're noticing traffic uh, changes or, or construction, you know, major construction uh, that's going on somewhere, mm -hmm. utilities that are being buried in a street and you want to let people know. Like right um, down at Oak Street right now. Sure. You know, and so how do we get all those things, how notices of all those things out? Our signage maybe could be better. We could have signage out ahead of time. Um, we certainly could have done that better on the Cypress Street debacle. You know, had, um, like the state does on Route 9, the state puts out uh, blinking lights and it says, you know, mm -hmm. coming in six weeks, coming in four weeks, coming in two weeks. So the traffic that normally, you know, all of that can be done better. Mm -hmm. um, but just simply getting the word out is a real yeah. devilish problem. Uh, I'd like to pick up on that too, That I, and I think uh, Engine 6 is a, a perfect example of the problems that Deb's uh, discussed, that uh, the housing partnership and the planning board f played out their usual not, uh, mailings and you know, I think even legal notices in the paper. Very few people, even including the activists, uh, read the legal notices enough for that to work. Not everybody's on a mailing list. I mean, in the case of Engine 6, in retrospect, uh, maybe uh, they should have used the um, uh, reverse 911 to that targeted geographic area. Mm, so, so, well, but uh, but so many people it's came not that like night. A snow emergency. Well, <laughs> but uh, it, I think it became a policy emergency and a process emergency that so tons of people heard about it through the channels you described, uh, but late, and then they came in with uh, uh, an attitude: uh, wh who's trying to slip something by? And 
the and, public did. Yes, yeah. and uh, uh, you and I and John Rice tried to fill the gap that hadn't been carried out by conducting those meetings, and uh, I think uh, the meetings did get the issues out on the table and did expose some of the weaknesses of the proponent. I, I mean, I've always thought well of Pine Street Inn. I was astonished at how poorly prepared they seemed that first well, night. I know you keep saying that, and and they weren't on they weren't on their game that first no. meeting. But uh, none of you were in the room at that first meeting. Oh, you were in the room, and not we were we were in the room. We were in the front of the room. Um, but um, you know the the anger and the angst but the the anger and the uh, the the treatment was it just knocked them off their feet i mean this was a, an entity um, both the pine street inn and the metro west collaborative um, as partners had been invited into the city to do this work they had made a proposal along with a few other people and theirs seemed to have legs and it went through the city process before it came to the planning board or the uh, housing partnership and the planning board. Um, and they were being welcomed by the administration. So um, although we warned them after the, the pre I went to the presentation at the housing partnership and um, insisted that they have a meeting with the local alderman, and they did, and we had, we had uh, an hour coffee, and that was fine. And we said, look, you know, this is not necessarily a piece of cake. You've got to get out into the community. Um, but they just were not prepared for right. what they what was there. Was the mayor wrong to cancel the second yes. meeting? Yes. Yes. Third. 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 third, 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 third there, there was the first meeting was with the proponent the. Propo proposers and the neighborhood. Then a second meeting was held, and we were told, uh, "Listen, we in the neighborhood just want to get our our heads on straight on this." And uh, a lot of what Deb just described happened again. But we did narrow down some things and did come up with some partial solutions. Uh, and uh, we uh, we and the city staff uh, gave that to the uh, the proponents and said, uh, "Okay, uh, next week this is." These are the topics you have to discuss, and these are the ways we suggest you discuss them. And uh, we uh, were informed uh, and just they before were ready that. To do that. Have, have each of you told the mayor to his face that you thought he was wrong? Yes. Yes. And what do you think he should do now? What Beats you, me. What it's that building now? Whatever the market. Uh, it's <laughs> privately leads. owned. It's yeah, not exactly. a city building. Yeah. We got to wait for the market to, yeah. to say what it wants to do at this point. Yeah. The the hospice has their own priorities uh, financially. Um, what was his response when you told him? That? Well, he had already decided. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask us, what should we do now? And I said, uh, well, if you cut it off now, why, why can't you just play it out, have the third meeting that's already scheduled, and uh, uh, hold the comment period open to the time when it was uh, scheduled, and then make whatever decision you, you want to make. And he said, well, that would be dishonest. It would be implying that uh, the matter was still up for discussion. And at this point, I'm not prepared to give, give them uh, this money. So. And the truth, you know, there was a lot of misinformation. Um, one of the pieces of misinformation was that there was a, a, a time limit on public discussion. The 30 days, the 30 days from the planning board uh, meeting, which was a public hearing. Um, but that's not quite true. The 30 days is a minimum requirement for uh, public discourse after such a proposal is put on the table. So the administration has the opportunity to request a longer period of time, uh, 60 days, 90 days, whatever. Um, and the truth is, the petitioners were ready to answer all of those questions. They got their act together. Um, they all the material, in fact, was posted online on the same day the third meeting was called off. That third meeting happened. Probably most of you know that at this point, but it happened without the administration. It and it happened in Newton Corner. Come on, but a Wabin project. It became a citywide issue, and the and the church hosted the meeting, and which I thought was actually lovely. So well, that's were, fine, but that's not the third Wabin meeting. It's a third meeting a third on that meeting topic. On the, exactly, exactly. So all of the questions that were asked at our second meeting, and which was the point of the second meeting, was to organize 
um, you know, what were the real and important questions that needed to be answered about the project. Um, all well, those well, things okay, were, got, were if, answered. If, you did, if they did, I've got a question on that. They said at the first meeting that uh, like 10 people a year go through their system, this is Pine, uh, and then it sounded like it was over 40 uh, at the, the next meeting. So that's, that's interesting. But I'm not it, sure what you're talking about. They said, somebody asked, first meeting, how many people go through the Pine Street Inn's homelessness system from in a, Newton, from Newton okay. in the course of a year, and they said, well, it's about 10. And uh, at the third meeting, uh, it, had, it had grown to about 40, which is fine. Uh, but the problem was they never laid it out in the first place. They didn't describe wh who these people were, what their situation was, how they had come to be homeless. And that's like so obvious. That's what uh, startled meeting, me that they didn't do I what was. I would say they weren't allowed to do that. There was not listening going on. The, well, yeah, but. Regardless, we're at a point yeah. right now where we still have an affordable housing requirement, a moral obligation to address. And we're sitting here in a situation where a project that could have helped to alleviate this particular situation, and by the way, also used federal tools that were available to us in the form of CDBG and home grants to actually start to solve this problem. Now, that conversation stopped, but we still have this need out here, and we still have these tools where we have federal agencies that are looking for us to put together a tangible plan for how we're going to address this using those tools. We well, need to restart We have the plan. We have, are not fulfilling the plan. So just so everybody knows who's listening or watching, you know, the, the city writes what they call, I don't for some reason call a consolidated affordable housing plan. This is, uh, we're, we're I entrusted. I think they mean because it's CDBG and home. I right. Think that's what they're talking about. Yeah, because we're entrusted with federal monies. It's not that much. It's about $2 million a year. Um, and uh, the lion's share of that money is supposed to be used to create new affordable housing units. Uh, a smaller but significant share is supposed to be used to support affordable housing units, renovations, upkeep, maintenance operations, that sort of thing. And a smaller percentage of that money is supposed to be used in areas, uh, target areas, which uh, draw low and moderate income persons. Um, and you may use the money for accessibility improvements on public land, but that should be a fairly tiny and right. relevant to the target areas. Um, yeah, you have a question about that? Actually, I'm going to change the subject. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Can you name a, a different time when you thought the mayor was wrong? A different instance, different issue? This is supposed to be about our race. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, yeah. for all of you because it's a checks and balances. You're Firing right? the chief. Firing the chief, the police chief? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I can I um, raise this as a resolution to the board um, during budget, which is when we get to uh, challenge the mayor on anything if you can't work it out ahead of time, um, and changed the di the direction for what's called the sustainability director. There have been some <laughs> firings in the um, or there was a position eliminated in the building department that I was unhappy with. Um, Chris. I was going to say I've had multiple conversations with the mayor with regards to the Riverside project and, uh, and specific things. I don't want to go into them because, of course, that's an ongoing conversation, but with regards to you know what we could have done there as well as the things we need to look out for there. Can I take a question from somebody? I've got a question. Um, parking comes up in various contexts. Uh, recently there's this idea to pilot uh, year-round uh, winter parking with a permit. Mm -hmm. uh, the Austin Street development, uh, one concept is to have units with very little parking, I guess capped at one parking space per unit to encourage uh, trans whatever, transit-oriented development. Um, how do you feel about the uh, allowing winter parking with permits, and is that in conflict with the idea of trying to have people own less cars? I don't think it's in conflict with it. I, I think it's an accommodation to uh, the realities. It, uh, the pilot has taken a lot of uh, staff time to develop with uh, the traffic planner, uh, the uh, transportation director, and uh, the police department working together. And it seems to be worth uh, a shot uh, that there are serious problems up in, uh, it's mainly, uh, yeah, yeah uh, that that is very dense. And many of the residents there complain that uh, other people uh, hog the spaces in front of the, uh, their house so that uh, they can't have people visiting them. So I think it's worth a shot. It may be too complex 
and uh, break down, but I, I think it's uh, worth the effort. Uh, just as uh, the, tra the parking plans around Newton North, both during construction and now, uh, were worth the effort that where you have an inherent problem of people living around something that uh, draws a lot of people uh, who want to park there, but uh, the, those targets were not developed with uh, sufficient parking. I think, you know, there are two different things. Newtonville, uh, the Newtonville proposal for the Austin Street lot is very different from what the Ward 1 aldermen <coughs> actually have been uh, promoting and asking us to uh, float a pilot in a very densely packed neighborhood um, that has probably, uh, down, go, looking down a street, you probably have more driveway curb cuts than you have actual space to park. Um, I, it's something they want to do and the neighborhood wants to do. It, um, I'm skeptical. We've asked that they take ve you know, very good notes on how this thing plays out. Um, it still has to go to finance. I think the other concern about it was that, it, you know, there's a cost associated with everything you do, every program you run, there's, there's staff involved and so forth, that it, it reflect that, you know, fees for these kinds of permits reflect the true cost. And then we have to see whether people really move out of the way uh, to make way for vehicles as you need them to take care of the streets. Um, the Newtonville project is something that's come out of, I think it seven, started seven years ago. Um, and at seven years ago, up till about two years ago, there were, were a huge number of uh, meetings with the community, with businesses, with residents, and so forth, um, and city staff, uh, planning department, and folks who worked on the comprehensive plan. It was what, one of, what we call one of our early action items. And, and all three uh, area aldermen were involved, the same ones we have now, um, and it, it was understanding that there was really kind of somewhat of a, uh, some of our villages are in a bit of a state of atrophy. Um, a lot of the shopkeepers can't afford to keep their doors open because there's not enough foot traffic and a lot of banks are moving in, um, advertising themselves by taking up a storefront. And um, what we'd rather see in our villages is a, is a more vibrant and diverse mix of uses that can serve the public better and in order to do that you need to have more foot traffic to support those businesses. So how do you make that all work? Um, the Austin Street parking lot has a certain amount of functional parking that's going to remain, you probably know that, um, so that there's, there are requirements that every developer has to meet in order to retain the functionality of that site. Um, but it's an opportunity if you put the parking underground um, and you serve parking for the units that are above and the commercial uses that are above as well um, to make to really begin to reconnect a community that was you know when the pike was put through was cut in half many 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 small homes were destroyed at that time to, and so that foot traffic basically that used to be there and serve the village uh, was no longer at that time um, so I think, though, you might be asking about, is one car enough when you have a one or two bedroom unit? Um, the idea is you're, you're near to the commuter rail. Um, a lot of folks actually uh, don't need a water to have bus. and maintain and pay for two vehicles. Um, it's really a perfect spot for that kind of thing. Um, if you only have space for one car, you can only have one car. Mm -hmm. So somebody would not choose to live there if, you know, if they wanted to have uh, two cars or three cars or whatever. It's just it's a it's a lifestyle choice. So I, I guess to the specifics of this, would would your support for the uh, winter parking be limited to people who really have no option other than to park on the street? Uh, could people like if, if people so we're back to Ward to One, yeah. <laughs> if people could move yeah. into yeah. Newville <coughs> yeah. into a unit with one one parking space and then. Somebody gets a job oh, in a different I place. see how you're making connection. I'm not at all convinced no. that this winter parking pilot is something that should be applied to any other area of the city. So um, basically limited to Nonantum. It's, is it, it is limited to Nonantum. It's a pilot to try to address a problem that they have there. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have to, that's the purpose of a pilot, we'll watch it really carefully. Um, I think there are certain neighborhoods where we absolutely should not have um, overnight parking in the winter uh, on the street. Because if you allow it, it will happen. Um, and then you ha there has to be somewhere to move those cars 
um, you know, when you need to take care of the streets. And that's not just during a snow emergency, but there are periodically throughout the winter you need to sand and salt and so forth. You could have ice. Chris, you agree that I, I completely should be agree. limited I, to the, I think we should be limiting it to the places where Brian, we try to uh, Yeah, then that's the way I voted. And I, I would also love to kind of take up the uh, concept of the Austin Street concept. Just one of those things that we are seeing just around us. In order to, to kind of keep young people as well as empty nesters in the city, uh, one of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace is people don't want to have as many cars. If we can set up a situation where they don't need one, if we can, if we can set up our village centers where you know, they have the ability to do shopping and access mass transit, they don't necessarily want to have more than one car. They want to be able to walk around things and not have the added expense of, of maintaining and trying to figure out where they're going to put their car. So if we can provide that opportunity for them, that's great. Uh, I, I, I now see the point that you were making. I don't think that we should be using this additional winter parking concept as an ability for them to get that second car through the through the city streets. No. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple questions that I'm hoping are yes no answers. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they are, and maybe they aren't. What do you got, Gail? Uh, do you support charter reform? Yes. Maybe. <laughs> no, I don't think it's uh, necessary. If it's not broken, don't There's fix it. There's a longer it. answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are stuff that you can do that might be useful, but I don't think it's urgent, and I think we've got enough major things that we should be uh, focusing our time and attention on. Okay, I'll give you two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think most people in the city of Newton don't know what the charter contains. Most people um, in the city, some people in the city of Newton don't know it's a city, not a town. That's correct. Um, and so I think it is incumbent upon, and I, I hope that uh, the League of Women Voters, and I said this in my answer to them, would take a leadership role in educating the citizenry about what this means. You know, what, and, okay. and why should we change it, and what specifically? Okay. Um, reducing the... What? You want two sure. I was just going to say, through having looked at the charter as well as the work that the league has already done with regards to you know, best practices in terms of governance, yeah, I think we should be opening up the charter. Reducing the size of the board. That is dependent upon the answer to the first question. Um, if we can take a look at the charter and determine exactly how we want to govern ourselves, I think it is entirely possible that we may find ourselves with a need for a smaller board volume. Yes. No. <laughs> uh, I'll start with you on this one. Term limits? <laughs> uh, we have them. They're called elections. I agree with that, actually. But I don't think we should have term limits for the school committee if we don't have them for the board of aldermen. Okay. Agree as well. And, uh, we have no need for term limits so long as we have appropriate elections. And I also agree that we don't need term limits on the school committee. Okay. Um, a fine for sh not shoveling your sidewalk? <sighs> I, I think that we need to be doing a lot more to make sure that those that are not physically able to shovel the sidewalks have the ability, have resources available to them. But I think for those able-bodied folks that uh, that should be taking care of their sidewalks, yeah, I think we should be having a stern conversation. If that has a monetary impact as well, then maybe so. Well, that avoided the yes, no, but you know, I think <laughs> <laughs> every so you're saying yes. How about that? Uh, there you yeah. go. Uh, I think. Yes, but of course you have to take care of people who can't do it for themselves. Uh, I originally opposed uh, the snow shoveling fines. I think Alderman Danberg did an excellent job of softening it to the extent that it, in practice it's not uh, being imposed. But I think the fines and the uh, sanctions uh, should be on people who have their own driveway shoveled or plowed out by dumping the snow onto the sidewalks across the street or at the edges of their property, and uh, that we should continue to make sure that our city plows do not uh, create uh, obstacles at the end of uh, every block so that uh, everybody shoveled on that block and then they get to the end and one across the street and there's a tremendous amount of snow there. So I think the secondary uh, examples uh, are, are what's really screwing up uh, uh, winter access and I think those should be focused on. Okay. This one's not yes, no, but there's only... There's only two answers, and you can only choose one. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you supporting for mayor? Oh, Frankie. <laughs> uh, I am not endorsing anyone for mayor because it makes sense Who to. Who are you voting for for mayor? 
We have secret ballot in this country. <laughs> weren't, weren't you aware of that? Yeah. Oh my God, uh, Gail, you got to keep up. <laughs> I think we should be focusing on our own race here, but you know, I, and I, I know neither of my opponents are are on record supporting anyone. But a year ago, I gave my name to Seti Warren. Um, with a promise that he stick around and implement the ambitious plans that he has for the city. Thank you. Is Chris was, oh. I, I, I chimed in at the same time that Brian did. I'm not endorsing that. I have another environmental question. Plastics. Uh, would you uh, support the idea of a ban on plastic, bag, plastic shopping bags in Newton and uh, the other side of plastics? Uh, one of the concepts of uh, for pay for throw would be to require people to buy special plastic bags to put their trash in before they put their trash in their barrels. So this is actually one of those issues. either of those ideas. What? Julia, this is one of those things that uh, that we actually we started to talk with some of the small business with actually some of the business community and the small business owners. Uh, there is a way of accomplishing this, and I would support us moving towards that 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 uh, that direction. I'd like us to get into a plastic-free situation. I think that it's we got some work to do with the small business owners to make sure that we can get there effectively. But I think we can do it. I agree. Um, you know, I've been long aware of the island of floating plastic debris in the Pacific Ocean the trees. and the trees and so forth. And um, we use so much more than we need to, in order to get through, you know, day to day. I think we can do it too. I think um, Allison Leary, who may well be joining the Board of Aldermen uh, next year, is running for Ward 1 Ward Alderman. Um, I don't know if folks know how much work she's done at the state as well as the local level um, in moving legislation uh, and advocating legislation to take care of some of these things. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, I'm mixed on this one. I mean, I prefer uh, paper bags because you can throw your other recyclables in them and put them in uh, the bins. Uh, but uh, there are some times when uh, uh, the plastic bags are more convenient for certain types of goods. I, I think stores could uh, make much more of a, an option of that. They tend to uh, veer to the plastic uh, first of all. Uh, but as someone, I've, I've led cleanups at Hemlock Gorge, and yeah, there's this plastic bags there, but there's a lot of other stuff that's thrown away. And basically the problem is the throwing away, that if you make it easier for um, the, the plastic bags to be recycled at the stores, and uh, in, in other ways, then I, I think uh, that's practical. But um, I just generally, I prefer uh, paper, as I say, but I'm not uh, ready to ban the plastic. Reusable bags. Yes. Reusable no, no, bags. No, no, come on. I have a car full of reusable bags. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> if you have that many reusables, then why don't you just have the one? Because I, I, I do bulk shopping. Oh. <laughs> and what about the idea of pay per throw? Is that something you would support? Would you support it only if there were a corresponding underwrite so it were not an effective uh, tax increase? Um, the latter is the interesting idea to yeah. me. I think, I think you don't implement a pay as you throw for the sake of saving the city that additional money while you're raising the tax base 2.5% at, at the same time. Um, or pr promoting a new override. I think you have to look at it uh, first and foremost as you know whether or not that's a better system for the city, whether or not that's going to achieve additional recycling, um, which you know in every community that's adopted it, the recycling rates have gone up uh, hugely. Um, so you know the idea is that's a real incentive for people to use less, waste less, and so forth, and recycle more. Um, so that, I think it should be on the table. I think we should continue to look at it. There was a study done four years, uh, two years ago, I'm sorry, just before uh, Alderman Schnipper retired, because um, she was on the committee, that uh, laid out some of the options. So we, you know, we have some information. I, I think we should keep looking at it as we're, but I think it needs to be part of the whole, our whole understanding of, of uh, resources and how much they cost. And, What's the best way to do business? It's also worthwhile to note that to some degree we have a pay-as-you-throw system right now with regards to the additional capacity bags. 
I agree with what uh, Chris said. I think it's worth uh, to continue looking at it, but I think there are more direct ways to encourage and assist people to recycle that um, sometimes I think financial incentives are very useful and letting the market guide things works. And in this one, I'm not convinced of that as yet. What are your other ideas for encouraging recycling? Well, there's a Reducing solid waste in general. Well, there's a, a whole combination of things, the, the separation, making it easier to separate uh, in, inside the house. I think we've actually done a decent, uh, that when we used to have three or four different categories that you had to put in different containers, I think that was discouraging. I think that we do, uh, putting all the recyclables into one can, I think is uh, beneficial and it makes it a lot easier, but there again, I don't think uh, all the citizens are completely aware of that, and uh, I think the whole issue of uh, public education is is the critical piece there. Well, the Green Decade actually had a great idea, and I hope the next time we issue barrels, we can implement it, which is to write on the cover of the barrel to have the information you need to have mm. succinctly. You know, this is what you put in this bin. Mm -hmm. um, the other program that um, I'd love to see uh, gain some headway is to separate compost, separate organics, um, and I, I know the city's looking at that. I think uh, I agree with what Deb said about uh, putting the info on uh, the barrels, but I think there are some things where it's it's not quite clear that um, how much do you have to clean a, a plastic container uh, in order that it doesn't contaminate uh, the recyclable stream and. Uh, the things at the margins are, are the tricky ones, um, and that's probably not going to be that easily put on the barrels. But I think putting the stuff uh, on the barrels is a, an excellent start. Maybe you don't have to wait till new barrels. Maybe you can issue people stickers. Stickers deteriorate, especially it, it's very quickly. Um, in that environment, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Plastic stickers? <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> um, you haven't had anything for Okay. I, the city's done a nice job in the past uh, acquiring open space. And we certainly have acquired some parcels around Crystal Lake. We've got playgrounds and parks. But we never have any money to maintain them. And I know that uh, we have a good example in Newton Highlands where we have uh, a public-private partnership with a garden in front of the high playground. Mm -hmm. How can we encourage other partnerships and involvement to maintain the places that we have, knowing that our investments are going to be very limited? Well, I think. Th oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, no. Go ahead. I think there's a couple sides to this. Um, at, at, let's look at the whole operations and maintenance picture. Um, as we're moving forward on a very ambitious capital plan, including lot, you know, lots of new schools and a fire station and new road work and so forth, um, we cannot afford to lose sight of what a robust operations and maintenance plan looks like for all of our city assets. Um, so that's buildings, roads, sidewalks, parks, um, trees. Um, Resource, alloc it's resource allocation is a, is a system of prioritizing, and it's also a way of managing risk, right? So the better, if you take better care of the things that you have, that goes a long way to reducing your long-term uh, costs and operations and to keeping the place. Obviously, you don't want to lose the quality of the environment that we have either. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, a, a good deal of it, I think, needs to come right from within our own uh, city operations budget. Um, but we should always be exploring public-private partnerships. Uh, the Greenway is a great example of where we have opportunity to do that, and I can bring up that. Uh, for example, we just uh, uh, recommended a special permit for the Biltmore to add seating. They're going to restripe their parking lot, and uh, it gives us an opportunity to talk about that edge between the, their parking lot and the Greenway, because they actually rent space from the MBTA. And so we're uh, talking quickly, because the opening is, is the ribbon cutting is today, with uh, Frank Nichols at Engineering to talk about exactly where the pathway goes there, because that business is very willing to landscape that edge. And you know we've already been talking, as we've, we've been walking that Greenway, for example, about how we can um, install native plantings and then who would take care of them, particularly watering and so forth. So 
every time there's an opportunity like that, you know, when you have the plan in place, that's why I love master planning and strategic planning. You have the plan in place, everyone's aware of the plan. When you have an opportunity, you can exercise a piece of it. Exactly, and just kind of along those same lines, there's a playground that's up the end of the street here. Um, there is at least one business, a uh, construction engineering firm, there that has expressed concern with regard to the condition of that over time, and they have said on um, a couple of different occasions that they would love to be a partner in whatever the city wants to do there. They just want to be able to get the city's attention with regards to what is the plan for that facility, and they would love to then make that, first of all, so it doesn't turn into a swamp each time it actually <laughs> They'd like to help with uh, with regards to making sure that the, uh, the streetscape in front of it remains open, welcoming, and safe. There are some issues with regards to some derelict cars that are parked on that particular area. They'd love to be a participant. I think that those are the kinds of conversations we need to have. Uh, I would agree that uh, public partnership, uh, the partnerships with the private sector, both the for-profit and the non-profit, that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, as president of the Friends of Hemlock Gorge, we've won cleanups uh, of that park for uh, the past decades. Um, and uh, we did do cleanups and cutbacks down on the Greenway that uh, uh, Deb's uh, Cutting back that day was legendary. <laughs> uh, and it's all grown back. It has. It has. So that's that's the tough part. It's a greenway. That, yeah. Well, it's, it's good for the greens, not for the people. That uh, obviously, when they they build that, the outside private sector who's being paid by. Uh, 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 giving them the value of the ties that they rip up. Uh, that's very clever and very innovative. Uh, but I would think, uh, well, like uh, you cited uh, the Highlands, uh, that was done, if I uh, led by Alderman Rice in his capacity as director of uh, the Highlands Community Development Corporation, and to have gotten the resources from renting the facility uh, that the city made available to the Highlands. Uh, CDC, I, I think, uh, is a very positive thing. That now that uh, with Chris's work completed, uh, uh, Wabin is making Ward 5 the only uh, uh, ward that has neighborhood area councils uh, in every every square inch. That's it. That we have uh, the ability to do uh, a lot of grassroots stuff there. That there are uh, uh, both cleanups and cutbacks that uh, uh, the, the highways in particular just get totally overgrown and uh, to the extent it's even unsafe. And part of that uh, is on, say, Mass DOT or, or the city, but part of that could be done and uh, you could get the attention of uh, the government agencies by having friends groups. And I think uh, the, Char uh, the Crystal Lake Conservancy, the Friends of Belos Pond, the Friends of Nahanton Park, as well as the Friends of Hemlock Gorge, I think have a great track record at being able to do stuff that probably would cost too much for uh, the government agency that owns the, the parcel, uh, but also gets the attention. So that, uh, well, if is this being shown live? Uh, uh, t tomorrow morning, we're doing a, a cleanup at Hemlock Gorge, and uh, basically, uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation gives us the bags, gives us the tools, and uh, volunteers go out and pick up the trash, put it in the bags, bring it down to uh, uh, where uh, the uh, uh, DCR can pick it up and dispose of it properly. So I think that's a, been a very positive uh, influence that's on it. That's what I call taking advantage of an opportunity yeah. for free advertising. <laughs> but to be clear, you're talking about Saturday morning, October 25. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. People are watching it after that. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, visit our website, <laughs> www.hemlockgorge.org, and you can uh, be on our list for future cleanups. And if you're in a different part of the city, you can pick up a wrench and a hammer and help build the playground up at Cabot Park. All right. Or the one coming up at Upper Falls. Exactly. Yeah. There's always work to do. Mm -hmm. And we need help moving the table back when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Saturday, October 26th. Six correct. Well, That's Saturday, right. 9 to noon. Okay. <laughs> Come down to Central Ave Thank in Needham. Doing this. Okay. And, and do, sir, for please it. tell uh, Margaret Albright and Andrew Steenstrup that we do not bite, and that it would be better if they turned down this opportunity. <laughs> we, just just because they were overwhelmed with other opportunities, I'm sure. No, I think they were afraid of us. But. Do we have time for one more question, or we're, oh, 1130? Uh, that's your call. You mean a quick one? I, I've got to ask a tree question. I don't know how yeah. many, I, I assume at least two of you are familiar with the tree preservation ordinance. Absolutely. Yes. You too. Okay, so for anyone who's listening, it uh, has required 
developers, it's aimed at requiring developers to plant replacement caliper inches or pay into a fund. Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, quite successful for big projects like uh, Chestnut Hill Square, where that money actually paid for the city's equipment uh, to have a tree crew. Uh, but it's been less successful at the single lot, you know, uh, house teardowns, other types of housing developments where many neighbors are upset to see trees coming down next to them. Um, the, the Urban Tree Commission uh, with, the, with Mark Welch and the legal department have been trying to come up with a solution. The best that we can come up with so far is some, to apply a, a permit requirement to everyone and get rid of the lot type of exemption, owner exemption, that type of thing, um, but allow everyone some type of minimal, like five trees in a 24 month period or something like that, or a cap per inch limit. Wow. Are you conceptually? I'm kind of okay? disappointed to hear uh, that you can't find some way around the phony owner thing. There is no way around that. Developers can make their purchase of a property contingent on the homeowner oh, cutting the trees yeah. down first. Well, there's that. We sell to the person who's buying the house and they get the exemption. Yeah. So are, are you conceptually okay with something like that as a way of I think we have to do seller? something because yes. I think the worst example of uh, uh, is down 295 Upland, where a developer bought the property, tore down 90 trees, dumped 100,000 square feet of fill. That was and, illegal according to our ordinances. Uh, well, it wasn't stopped at the time. Yeah, I, I realize that. But, you know, you do have scoff laws out there, which is... Well, the inspections commissioner, in commenting on that, which he said was the worst abomination he'd ever seen in his life, uh, and that's something that said done, that... The neighbors haven't seen it, so it's not... That's like right, the so it didn't happen in a vacuum. Oh, no, the neighbors, yeah. Oh, yeah. we've been over there. Yeah, well, that, that's that's one of the real shortcomings that you wind up with neighbors. Everybody down there, particularly the ones down on Winchester Street, who don't want to be flooded or avalanched on, uh, uh, they all had to hire lawyers, engineers, landscape architects to work out some kind of a plan that uh, would actually hold the water uh, appropriately and uh, replace the convict blocks that they had at the bottom with something more aesthetic. That shouldn't be on uh, the other homeowners. They pay their property taxes here. They should be protected from stuff like that. And it's uh, just disgraceful that th that did happen. The inspection commissioner said that uh, we did need to uh, go back to the, the tree ordinance. And if well, whatever you guys are looking at, if that's what the expertise uh, tells us we have to do, then we have but to at, do it. At, at the same time, it's kind of analogous to the whole teardown situation mm -hmm. where uh, you know, we've anecdotally talk to people where they're as upset as they, as they are at neighbors cutting down their trees, they don't want themselves restricted. And yes, so that's, the, ba that that's the balancing system. act that, that you balance. always get. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's tough to play out. And we'll, we'll be waiting for guidance from our wonderful community volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and we remind our viewers voters, bloggers, everybody to vote on November, November 5th. 5th.